Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Consummate Athlete Podcast, where we dissect all kinds of different types of performance in hopes that you guys and ourselves can learn about all different types of movement and sports and everything. Uh, For those of you who are new to the show, I'm Molly Herford. I write all about all different types of fitness, nutrition type stuff, particularly endurance sports, and I occasionally do said endurance sports. And I'm Peter Glassford. I'm Molly's co-host here on the Consummate Athlete Podcast, and I am a registered kinesiologist and an endurance coach. Yeah, so this week we're recording this from California. We've been here for a few weeks. Our time here is starting to wind down, so I think we're both starting to get a little panicked about soaking in as much sunshine as we possibly can before we head back east and back into the the snowstorms that are plaguing our poor families that are home on the east coast. Yeah, winter is arriving, and yeah, people are able to ski, though, so there's all sorts of consummate athlete opportunities opening up i think the number one consummate athlete thing was last year when we ran the consummate athlete christmas uh challenge and we had one of our people uh, who listens to the show head out with some sled dogs i think that was the ultimate in consummate athlete e-ness yeah definitely people were doing some you know getting the kids out and doing some tobogganing some sledding uh, they were, what else were they doing? They're shoveling. I actually had a qu- question from a client this morning about shoveling and whether that could be training. And... I love shoveling for training. And I tend to, he was a cyclist, so I tend to fall on the, you know, if we can do a bit of riding and then bundle up and go out and shovel snow carefully because mm-hmm. often when snow shoveling becomes training, it also becomes injurious, if that's a word. I think that's a word. Uh, so I don't, you, you I don't think it means what you think it means so need, in this case. You but. need, I guess. <laughs> um, I think it's, is that like law? It's like a law term? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so if they can sort of warm up on the bike, get coordinated, and then go outside and shovel carefully, so lifting with good form and so forth, you know, pushing the snow. Um, if we keep the heart rate monitor on, then, you know, we're able to sort of see what that loading looks like. I don't think you always have to do that, but it's nice. I always say if, if the question of is this training pops up, then, you know, that's what you do. You put that on and you can sort of see what it looks like. And then ideally jump back on the, the trainer. And so we, we definitely do that. Mm-hmm. And that's something that can work fairly well. And I get- really like that. Shoveling has always been kind of one of my favorite kind of things because it's super efficient and you get really sweaty doing it when you're <laughs> when you're going yeah i mean i think it's it's one of those things like the job gets done in the driveway or whatever you're shoveling i guess you know the walk is is clean and uh you know if, if you can call that you know you sort of stay engaged and you're lifting with good form and you're you know trying to you have a strategy so i think it's one of those things that can be quite meditative and and this feeling of accomplishment at the end. Bonus, your spouse doesn't get super pissed that you're in riding the trainer while he or she is out shoveling cold, wet snow. I guess that's true too, right? You could start with that maybe in the morning or something when people are sleeping, and then you could even transition to your, your running or cycling or whatever else you're going to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so anything, anything new and exciting with you this week? No, just people rolling here you know it's it's early season for a lot of the the summer sports cycling of course included and yeah we're just putting in the the work right and he's showing up every day and the resolutions are slowly starting to fade although we were actually talking about this earlier and guys we'd love to hear from you if you agree with this this year it feels like everyone is really into resolutions yeah i guess we're still talking about it yeah yeah it's, it's been a huge Every article I read, although now it seems as though the news media has kind of shifted from like the 10 ways you can keep your resolution to why you didn't need a resolution to begin with or why it's okay if you've already not completed your resolution. Well, I thought I saw you post that it's, what day are we at now? It's like the 20th of January. I think you posted this week that there's one day. Strava came out with a report suggesting that January 17th is uh, National Quitters Day. So, so 17 days, that's how long we last. It's the most likely for people to drop off of Strava with their activities, I guess. Uh, uh, so okay. I thought that was pretty interesting. And it makes sense, right? It's two and a half weeks. You're kind of just far enough in that you're starting to get a little bored of whatever you're doing. Or if you're me, you get really annoyed with uploading things. Um, that's definitely my biggest vice. So I'm going to say it's not necessarily that people aren't getting out and doing stuff. It's 
Maybe just that they've kind of fallen off the recording bandwagon partially. Well, no wonder too, that's sort of right smack dab in the middle of the sort of two to three weeks on and then recovery week, right? Mm. And, and I think if people start in with a bunch of vigor uh, in that new year, right, they might have been charging pretty hard, maybe a, bit, a little too much too fast. But it, it could be just, you know, the two weeks is sort of the recommended load time often for like a, a mm-hmm. master's as we get older. Uh, and then three weeks is sort of the classical three weeks on, one week off. So I wonder if, you know, if, you, if you're at that phase right now, it might just be you need to take, you know, keep the routine up, but just back off the intensity and the suffer festivals and all these things, mm-hmm. you know, and, and take a, a little bit of a recovery week. And then maybe you could get through to that because it's like 21 days is when the habit is yeah. supposed to be. That's what you always hear. So maybe it's just people need to sort of ease through, but get, re- get it done. Right? <laughs> a rest week does not mean you gave up. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, you could just be, like I say, that the routine, you want to keep that going, but it's just softer, right? Like a deload week in the gym, you would do, you know, maybe similar loads, but less reps, you know, or less sets. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're in there maybe a little less time, but you're still in there, right? Mm-hmm. You're still going to the gym, still have the routine. And then on the bike, it might be, you know, a 45 minute, just easy, comfy spin, you know, mm-hmm. barely breaking a sweat even, right? So yeah, something to consider, I guess, if you're feeling that motivation. Sometimes it's not that you have to work harder. Sometimes you need to back off, right, and sort of let that build back up. Mm-hmm. All right, so shifting gears completely, uh, today's guest uh, is actually talking all about one of my newfound favorite things, bike packing. Uh, so we have Matthew Cady, who a lot of you have probably read articles by him in the past. Um, if you've read pretty much any cycling magazine, um, if you've picked up the book Rocket Fuel, which has a ton of really, really tasty recipes in it, uh, that is all him. But uh, in addition to being a nutritionist and really focusing on sports nutrition, uh, he's an avid bike packer and is kind of trying to figure out a really good route for uh, a good bike packing route in Costa Rica, actually pretty near where we recently went on vacation. Uh, So that's pretty exciting for us, although now I'm a little worried we're going to have to go back to Costa Rica on bikes instead of hanging out on the beach, but it sounds pretty good. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I think from our our previous uh, line of discussion with taking it easier, right? I think this bike packing, you know, and gravel riding led into bike packing uh, is becoming quite popular with people, right? Mm-hmm. And whether it's just a phase of their season, you know, I have lots of clients who are still racing, you know, cycle cross road, whatever. Uh, but they're also including some bike packing adventures, maybe as part of their, you know, their base phase, just building up volume, or just, you know, after the season, after the big race, they go on a big bike packing mission right mm-hmm. so i think it's in all different forms and we talk about the sort of range of what bike packing can be um you know from a single day just riding to your friend's house almost all the way up to something more crazy like costa rica giant loop or we talk about a loop he's already got set up in ontario uh, our home province in canada uh a big i think it was was it 700 700 k so 700 like kilometer 400 miles ish yeah, yeah. So we talk about that, uh, I guess, event um, or, or that loop. It's, it's both a, a loop you could do at any time, but there's also sort of a big send off or a, a grand depart, I think is maybe mm-hmm. what we call this. Um, but yeah, some really interesting topics ranging from sort of how to with bikepacking. And then also we get into a little bit of nutrition and making, you know, food for bikepacking, but also just some sort of uh, portable type food that you can bring with you on a ride, you know, a training ride or, or whatever. Yeah, super interesting episode. It's it's cool, you know, Matthew and I have written for a ton of the same publications, so it was pretty sweet to actually get to connect with him and sort of hear his backstory. And he's got a ton of good little anecdotes kind of sprinkled throughout, too. Yeah, it was good, good mix. And I think a shout out to our friend Linda, who connected us um, as well. So definitely appreciate that. And all of you are our friends as well. So if you, you know awesome people, um, you know, it's very likely that you know, you know, people that would be awesome to talk to and that other people would enjoy learning about as well. So for sure use the, there's a contact page at consummateathlete.com. You can use that or you can reach it to Molly or I on the 
the social medias, which Molly will give you our handles because I don't know them. I mean, it's pretty basic. At Peter Glassford or at Molly J. Herford. Uh, yeah, we'd love to hear from you guys. Um, I got a bunch of new questions in for an upcoming Q&A uh, just this morning. So, you know, those of you listening, keep them coming. We're going to be recording a couple of Q&As in prep for the fact that I'll be gone for a few weeks. So the more Q&As you guys can get us this week, the better. All right. Without further ado, let's get into this episode with Matthew Cady. Uh, well, I guess I would say my job title is most, I mean, I'm a registered dietitian by profession, right? Um, but I guess I mostly pay the bills by writing uh, nutrition articles and um, developing recipes for magazines, online, and uh, various cookbooks. I know the three of us have shared <laughs> uh, bylines and some similar publications over the years, right? like uh, Runner's World and Canadian Cycling and Bicycling. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I was gonna say I thought your name sounded really familiar, and I think that's probably why I've just seen it on the like on the same page as mine, even because you and I even have books that came out in you know years. I think mine was 2015, and Rocket Fuel was 2016. Correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, I've, uh, I mean, I've definitely seen your guys' names and the same stuff I've worked on. So <laughs> it's great to finally. Uh, to um, speak to each other for sure. And now, are you Canadian, or, or where did you grow up? Yeah, yeah, I grew up in uh, Toronto, Ontario. Okay, um, but I currently live in uh, Waterloo, Ontario, which right. is about an hour west, depending right. on how bad the traffic is. Sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it just happened. I, I guess like most of my most of my income and work comes from south of the border because that's just the bigger the bigger mm-hmm. marketplace. You guys are well aware of it as well yeah exactly we're we're in very similar situations you and i for yeah. sure <laughs> <laughs> if i was trying to feed myself on canadian writing i'd be in a lot of trouble for i know i know <laughs> okay so you have this big trip coming up bike packing in costa rica correct Correct. Yeah. Okay. So before we dive into everything about you, we just talked about packing before. I have to know what is what is in your your bag. I I've been obsessed with the articles where it's like what's in your purse for so many mm-hmm. years. So now I'm like, what's what's in the bag? What are you packing? Well, we have. I mean, it's all in a. <laughs> our packing is in a bag. It's all in this two big bike boxes. Um. But so yeah, so so we're taking our mountain bikes, and we have. It's a matter of figuring out what is the least amount of material that you need to bring, but still be comfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, so for Costa Rica, it's a little easier because um, I mean, you guys were there in December, so you know it's pretty, pretty dry and hot. Yeah, we brought way part. too many clothes for our like beach. Yeah. Retreat. <laughs> Okay, you say that, but we also didn't have a washer, so we were also washing stuff in yeah, the sink. Yeah, that's true. Our problems were pretty active, which I guess would be similar with bikepacking. Really, like you're, you're sweating all day. Is this, so while you don't need parkas or, or things like you might in, in Canada we, with our toques and so forth, um, you do, Se- you do sweat shabbies. all day. So like, how do you get around the laundering of, of clothes? Um, well, two things. I mean, I have definitely two pairs of bike shorts. I know some guy <laughs> I've read about you know, blogs and stuff. When people go with one pair of shorts, that just uh, those people that just are sound crazy. wrong in every single way. <laughs> Sounds risky. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, we. I mean, we definitely after every ride, it's um, whatever kit you're wearing that day gets washed in the sink and you know hung up. And I mean, that definitely does the trick for for a, at least a week or two before maybe you want to do stay at a place for a night and do some extra laundry. Right. Uh, and, and you guys way. are camping like this is full on like outdoors the whole time. Yeah, but th- uh, this one won't be because we're really, really traveling lighter. So we're just going to stay at kind of local guest houses. Okay, uh, this sure, is more in fairly... my more where I'm comfortable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, fairly like inexpensive, um, especially you know with the two of us, my uh, girlfriend and I, we split the the cost, so that helps a lot. Um, yeah, we just figured you know unless I guess one of my thoughts is with these bike packing trips unless you know you're willing to camp a fair amount then you have to decide if carrying all that camping gear is kind of you know worth the extra weight because it really does add up the tent the sleeping bag the thermo rest <laughs> yeah that is a lot of extra space 
So. Yeah, I did a, a bike packing press trip uh, probably eight months ago now, and I was. I, you know, I thought I was like bare bones and it was still a billion pounds. And I did the classic uh, stand up to pedal on the first hill and immediately wipe out because I was so back weighted. <laughs> so yeah. super embarrassing. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's kind of one of the things with the new modern like bike packing bags is like to distribute the weight a little better, mm -hmm. like with the front handlebar. Because I've been guilty like last year, this is our second straight trip to last to costa rica we were there last year and i had all my weight kind of in the back mm -hmm. and costa rica one thing is not is known for is not really incredibly long passes of like 20 kilometer climbs but these incredibly steep yes just like <laughs> 17 20 percent grades where it's just like a total suffer fest for a few minutes and when i had all my weight at the back it was like I, mean, I don't like I the heart was just coming out of my throat <laughs> <laughs> so uh, right. I'm trying to distribute things a little better on this time around so right so now I, we don't want to go too deep on bags but that is people are always curious like Molly says they like sort of the the gear side of things like are you using sort of a handlebar bag uh sort of like it looks almost like a, a duffel almost underneath the handlebar and then there's like a frame bag and then the sort of like I call it like a fender bag almost at the back is that sort of what you're using or, or what, what are you using yeah exactly with? everything everything but the frame bag because um just how light we're packing for this trip right but yeah like a big kind of a like a one of those bike packing style um, harnesses at the front where I have a dry bag full of, and that's where I'll keep my like clothes. So it's not too heavy, but it's kind of a, a good place to put some bulk. And then I have a special, yeah, one of those bigger kind of saddle bags where right. I can put more, of, uh, you know, more of the other stuff like um, some camera gear, sandals, food, stuff like that. I've, I've been very close to pulling the trigger on one of those and I just, I don't really need it that badly at the moment, but yeah. <laughs> is is there a, a brand that you would recommend as far as bags or what ones do you use? You don't even have to recommend it. You can just whichever ones you use. Yeah, I have no problem. Um, for the rear one, I use an Arkell one because it's really sturdy. Okay. I bought a, I bought more a minimalist one before this trip. And this always proves it's always a good idea <laughs> to test out your gear before you go. Mm -hmm. And it didn't have like, the, like the metal harness it was lighter and a little bigger but that thing flopped around like a whale on a beach it was it was just my girlfriend was like i'm not running behind you with that so it's almost like you you can get yeah, ones without yeah. a frame that would almost be more like your normal under the seat sort of bag just like much bigger or longer um but you can get ones that sort of have a frame i guess almost more like um like it's just a like a, a normal frame and sort of pannier would would work right yeah, like the one from Arkell I have has like a metal kind of um, kind okay. of mount that ho hooks onto the saddle and the the the, okay. st the seat post. Right, right. And then you just you slide the bag on this. So the one benefit is there's not that much sway because you do have some weight back there. Mm -hmm. um, so it's good for when you're going down kind of like more of the the sketchier type of gravel roads. Right. Okay. And uh, terrain like that. Yeah, that's good to know. Now, backing up almost, like, what, what are you guys doing down there? Like, are, are you just doing this for sort of vacation, or are you? is there a bigger purpose to, to this mission you're on? Yeah, we have a bit of a bigger purpose. So when we were there last year, uh, we did a big kind of loop, and we, were, and we would notice all these other kind of trails and, and roads. So we're like, well, what if we went back next year with um, the purpose of maybe trying to come up with some sort of loop that we could plot and map and and then share that as like you know this incredible you know one or two week bike packing loop in Costa Rica. Um, so that's kind of our uh, our goal with this trip is um, just to explore a few different areas and figure out um, if this is something that people who are really want to ride somewhere warm in the North American winter <laughs> right. can head over there for a couple of weeks because it's really. I mean, it's really raw kind of mountain biking there. You know, there's a lot of just these kind of dirt tracks and these things through the forest and along these beaches that are, you know, just kind of unmaintained back to like old school mountain biking, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And getting onto single track at times or, or like how? how yeah, we're going to try some of that as well. Yeah. 
Okay. We and definitely they do saw, have a few. Yeah, we saw a few guys on mountain bikes, and it looked like they had been actually mountain biking um, beyond, you know, just sort of the, the gravel roads and stuff like that, which, I mean, the terrain is amazing, like you say. Even if it was just gravel roads, it'd still be pretty good riding, but... I wondered if there was... Yeah, a... there's a mixture of there. And, I mean, Costa Roca is, I think, one of the very first stage mountain bike races. Um, I forget what that's called, but it's been going for decades Oh, La Ruta? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that might have been <laughs> kind of like one of the the original crazy kind of Yeah, and it's stage wild. Races. Like, I don't know. I yeah. feel like you spend more times riding on, like, raw, like, rail bed or something. But uh, you're, you're right. There definitely is single track and then some good riding for sure. People seem to keep going back. So, Yep. The uh, the very steep climbs, like you say, though, are definitely – I think that one is, is especially hard with the very steep climbs in the muddy soil. Yeah, and then – around kind of where this focus is like the Nicoya Peninsula and during the dry season that's like a can be pretty dusty right um so you're not going to get a lot of mud but you're definitely going to contend with contend with like kind of drier conditions and the other thing I want to mention with Costa Rica especially this area we're going to if you do want to camp there I can't believe a place like this has so many undeveloped beaches like that are just perfect for putting up a tent at night and no one's going to be around and you're going to have this in these incredible beaches all to yourself, really. It's uh, pretty special that way. Yeah, it's pretty wild. We were in Santa Teresa, and just the, uh, like you say, the expanse of sand beach that, you know, we were there sort of right at the junction, the end, I guess, of rainy season coming into the, I guess, the whatever, the, the drier season. Um, but just, there really weren't that many people. Yeah, it's, I would say, I was like, like to say it down there for every one beach that has too many people or overdeveloped there's like five more that you can find that you can just go down to and totally <laughs> relax and chill out and there's hardly anyone around mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but for such a tourist destination it's um it actually did kind of surprise me that way um, i'm a little upset with this conversation because i'm afraid it means we have to bring our bikes next time we go to costa rica and the reason we went there was my like thing was like no bikes we can't bring any bikes and now now i yeah. think it's now we're just both going to be thinking about this so well i mean <laughs> matt matt may actually have another solution that will keep you from having to go to costa rica to bike pack because you also have an a, a event of sorts that's based in ontario that's bike packing do you want to tell us a bit about the bt 700 yeah, so I've been working um, last couple of years on plotting um, like a big loop in southwestern Ontario. Um, the motivation was I think you pretty pretty much have to be living in a cave as a cyclist not to see that bike packing has just become like a beast of its own. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's hugely popular now, like because people kind of look for more kind of off-road routes to travel with like multi-day traveling um one one reason is because the roads everywhere around the world aren't becoming any quieter so people want to explore more off the beaten path kind of destinations and routes and and um different just a different style of cycling so just yeah with that thought i was as i more and more i explored all these like um i mean you guys are up by collingwood right yeah. Yeah, and I grew up in yeah. Mansfield, so pretty familiar with that sort of yeah. whole swath down to the GTA. So we have some amazing, um, so just some amazing gravel roads. Yeah. Um, with hardly any traffic and just really beautiful and peaceful, um, and also a, a big network of kind of rail trail. Uh, so as just, I just started riding more of these, I thought, I wonder if it'd be possible, like if you could just build like some kind of multi-day loop. Um, so last summer I just was more and more exploring and trying to piece all this together. And next thing you know, I had this like 715 kilometer (laughs) kind of, kind of big kind of loop. That's like pretty much, I think about 85% off pavement. So I'm pretty happy with that. And then, so I plotted it, came up with a website, came up with a name, which we can kind of discuss what that means in a second. And threw it out there and next thing you know i got like within the first week i was having trouble keeping up with my email (laughs) on this because there was just so much interest and people were like thanking me 
thanking me, thanking me, thanking me just because they were urging for the hungry for this somewhere like in Eastern Canada, because there's so many of these kind of events and bikepacking routes in Western Canada and Western US, but just kind of a dearth of it um, more on the East Coast. Um, or central Ontario, uh, Canada. Right, right. So people so, are pretty so excited where does it about that. Go like, is there a point to point? Like, where, where is it? So what sort of rough area? If people know some town names or city names, or like, is it Toronto to somewhere, or where are we headed? No, it's more. It, I mean, the official start point is a small kind of village called St. Jacobs. Oh, nice. Um, just kind of close to Waterloo, Kitchener, and then from there it heads over to um, uh, Lake Huron. Um, up towards, um, I guess, uh, Singhampton and areas kind of like that. And then from over there, it starts uh, slowly wandering towards Owen Sound and then um, more like Thornbury and uh, Blue Mountain, which is a big, big area a lot of people know about. And then um, starts heading down south from there and then um, back towards St. Jacob's for this, like, you know, huge kind of loop. Um but the good thing is it's near such a kind of big population area, like just Toronto and all that, that people can kind of jump in on this at anywhere they want. So if uh, like if you guys wanted to do it and you live in Collingwood, you just leave from your front door and you, you start the loop from there. <laughs> right, right. Now, is it this stuff often, even some of those big events you're, you're alluding to at West and stuff like they'll it's sort of free. You can do it whenever you want. Um, but then there's often like an official you know, not a race, but an official sort of, like you say, a depart uh, where a bunch of people might go on the same day or, or leave at the same time. And so are you thinking something like that? Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. So the route is open. Obviously, I don't own any of it. and <laughs> I don't have any, uh, you know, you have to pay me to do it or anything like that. But it's open to ride at any time of the year. But July 14th this summer, I'm going to try a grand depart from St. Jacob's. And I've already got about 40 names signed up, which is pretty pretty wild um and uh we're gonna see how that goes i mean it's not like everyone has to ride together you know riders have different speeds some people got their heads down and they want to do like 200 kilometers a day which you know could more power to them (laughs) (laughs) whereas some people just want to take a week you know take a vacation take a week and explore more of their not too far from home um and go at that speed but uh yeah it should be uh, it should be interesting to see how this all works. So if nothing, it's it's created a you know some sort of route that will hopefully you know outlast me as well. That can be enjoyed at any any time for people to um, to explore their um, explore like what the amazing trails and roads that we really do have. Right. So now, so now in this day and age, is this, you know, is this an app? Is this a, you know, a paper map people can order or like as far as the route itself, like you're, you're certainly not putting, you know, road signs up at this phase of the game. But, um, you know, how is this loop sort of like followed, I guess? Uh, well, the way it works is I plot it all with um, a program. I'm not sure if you guys are aware of it. It's Ride with GPS. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And, um, I mean, these guys are amazing. It has such a powerful plotting system and editing system. Um, so I'm happy to plug them as much as I can. And basically, people would just download this route. So um, either on their, like, garments, on their handlebars, or their um, mobile phones. And you could just follow it that way. So I think a paper map would be pretty tough to, to find everything. <laughs> So the ideal the ideal would be to f- to have like the GPS navigation as you're as you're moving along. Right, right. Um, kind of backing up, actually. How did you end up getting into bike packing? What was your first trek like? Yeah, like did you come from racing and then just get disenfranchised, or like why? How did how did you end up with this, okay. this bike packing? Uh, well, I think what happened is oh, I'm, eight, I'm dating myself now, but like in the late nineties. I was kind of, I just had finished um, my master's degree in sport nutrition and I was kind of in between school and figuring out exactly what I wanted to do in the real world. Um, So I took a job as being like a a cycling guide out in Eastern Canada um, and spent a summer doing that and that kind of just, you know, 
um, gone in my head that's like bike travel is pretty awesome <laughs> in every way imaginable almost. And uh, so, yeah, so from that I decided, okay, I'm not really ready to um, join the workforce yet. So I booked a three month trip to New Zealand and decided, well, I'm going to test out uh, bike touring that way. And I had no idea what I was doing, and I got lost often, didn't eat enough, <laughs> somehow survived that trip. And I think that kind of just, from there, it's been really just a passion of mine to like try to find different places to go cycle. Um, so everywhere from Myanmar to Sri Lanka to Cuba to um, Portugal, Costa Rica, and... I think it's almost impossible for me not to think about <laughs> cycle touring at some point during a, during a calendar year. Um, and more and more as I do it, it's become clear that I also urge to go explore um, more isolated areas or gravel roads and trails where those can take you where you know the pavement doesn't quite go. And yeah, I don't think, I mean, I don't think bikepacking has a set definition. I think it can be what you make it. And I think that's important to mention. Um, I mean, in April, my girlfriend and I spent a month cycling in Southern Portugal and that was probably about 90% pavement, but it was amazing. It was like incredible. Like all these just quiet paved roads that meander through the Portuguese countryside without much traffic. Um, so I don't know if you just define that as bikepacking or not, but I still define that as a good time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I think like you say, it's the, the lines between, you know, cycle touring or bikepacking or, um, you know, even just, you know, road riding itself, right? Like the, the, the there's very blurred lines there, I think. Yeah, exactly. I think, you know, everyone's comfortable with a different degree of what they want to do. You know, some people want to like, again, pack one pair of bike shorts and a bivy and go crazy for a week in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not quite what I look forward to, uh, but that's, you know, what some people really enjoy. And then some people like to, you know, put on the old school panniers and right. still do it kind of more traditional style. I think it's a huge mistake to think that one way is better than the other. Well, and it maybe uh, relates too to like your past experience, right? Like I know lots of people we know who are, you know, very experienced backpackers, you know, they've, they've gone camping and they've done the like on foot with like one set of clothes and like you say, a bivy. So for them to get on a bike and have just a bivy and camp on the side of the road, like it, it's well within their wheelhouse. Whereas for me, that would be mind boggling, right? Like I've spent my life racing around in small circles and staying in hotels. So for me, it, uh, I think my first steps would be more, you know, the credit card. What is that called? Credit card bike touring or something like that, where you sort of just go, yeah, yeah, go yeah. between the Motel 6s or whatever and work your way across the country. I thought we said no more Motel 6. Yeah, Molly said no more. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about Those this. Those are all right. <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, that's too fun. <laughs> yeah, but uh, is is there sort of a way as far as first forays into bikepacking? Um, is, is there like how how did you? What was your first one? Like, did you do something like what I'm describing, or or how did you you know tr test out your equipment even? Uh, yeah, I think I'm trying to think when exactly because I've always for so many deck like so many years I always had you know the traditional kind of panniers and and working through that way. Um, Partly because back when I first started, there just wasn't, it wasn't an easy to, you couldn't, there was no GPS systems <laughs> on your bikes or anything. So it was harder to find um, some more of the off beaten locations. But uh, I think really the first really actually hardcore kind of more off road focused tour was last year in Costa Rica for us. Um, and then that kind of, has really spurred us more on to maybe making that a little more of a focus on our on our travels from from this point forward so instead of just you know focusing more on the more of a, the traditional kind of pavement panier styling trying to 
narrow down our gear more to being a little more uh, stealth and being able to do more on kind of off-road off-road um trails and i should mention i mean there's now with bikepacking become so popular so many routes already being plotted for people so they don't need to necessarily like because that takes a ton of time <laughs> i know from personal experience plotting a route from scratch is a really really time consuming process so people can go on like a website like bikepacking.com and just search different routes around the world and that that can be a really good start for certain people right and i saw um, your, your I also, loops already up on bikepacking.com right yeah correct yeah so we'll make yeah. sure we link to that for people as well so they can find the bt700 details yeah that would be awesome should we discuss what the bt stands for yeah i yes. was just gonna say <laughs> so um if there is one kind of sweet type of baked good that's ubiqui ubiquitous in canada or ontario what would you guys say that would be uh, butter tarts, right? There you go. <laughs> so through the scouting of the entire route, I mean, my girlfriend and I would eat copious amounts of those to help fuel our rides. I shouldn't say, as a dietitian, I shouldn't say that's like the healthiest thing in the world, but um, it's very comforting <laughs> for sure. So I was just looking for a kind of a fun name for the for the right. route, and I figured, you know, every country store you go to now and little convenience store or whatever they'll always have some sort of tray of butter tarts so um and just thinking about places like, on that loop there's definitely a good chunk like i know around collingwood and and even over towards like oxbridge and stuff like it, you're right it's basically every like sort of corner roadside store i would have them and there's like huge like people are like i don't i don't think they get to like fights about it but there's a really controversy about like where the best ones are found mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, I know I have my kind of favorites, but I yeah, like it'd that. be interesting. Just, yeah. Okay, now because you're a dietitian and because we're talking about butter tarts now, bike packing nutrition. You mentioned in New Zealand you weren't eating enough in that those first years. So what have you learned about you know how to fuel for that kind of day on the bike? Yeah, I think I mean for me it's important to start like with a really, really pretty big breakfast in the morning that if I don't eat enough first thing in the morning by like 20 K in, I'm already feeling kind of a bit lightheaded. Mm -hmm. So kind of, I've learned that. Um, and also to fuel yourself by kind of embracing the foods of where you are. So I always, we always made fun of like, we'd go to these places in Southeast Asia or in Laos or Thailand. And, you know, people would be more of kind of some of the restaurants that are appeasing, uh, trying to appeal to Western tastes. And, mm -hmm. and like people are ordering pizza. I'm like, I'm not in Thailand to order pizza. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> that's always a bad idea for many different reasons. Yeah. So, yeah. So we'll like, um, for example, if when we're, you know, it's touring in Thailand, like we would try to stop at a, just a mom and pop kind of little, little, uh, restaurant for lunch and order whatever noodle dishes they would have and stuff like that. So I find your body really adapts and starts to crave the foods of where you are cycling. And I think once it does that and you start, you know, being really curious about trying new stuff, you're almost like naturally fueling pretty well because you're eating enough. Mm -hmm. just by being hungry for what is being provided and like offered by like little local restaurants yeah. and uh, street markets or whatever like that. So, I mean, when you're gone for four weeks, you can't pack all the energy bars and, and gels you're going to need. Like you can't carry that much weight at the start. Mm -hmm. like, no, there's just there... not room for that. Yeah. Is there anything you do pack? Do you bring any like protein powder or like emergency bars or anything like that with you? Yeah, I have a huge tub of protein powder in my back. <laughs> my <laughs> <side bag>. no, <laughs> <kidding>. <laughs> yeah, it just, just uh, takes up the whole back thing, but worth yeah, it, yeah. worth it. <laughs> no, I always, but I do bring like what I always dub as kind of like the emergency kind of bars and gels. Like I bring just like a, like a handful of them. Mm -hmm. uh, in case we we're kind of stuck out in the middle of nowhere and i'm like totally because i i have like one of those metabolisms where i kind of need to eat a lot mm -hmm. uh, so i need to like 
yeah, I always like there've been times I've been like, oh man, I am in trouble and I don't have anything. Yeah. So I've learned to always pack a couple, a couple spare pieces of energy just mm-hmm. in case. And I think a lot of people, for a lot of people, that's probably can be a good idea. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's funny. I I'm terrible for eating on the bike, even though I, I've also written books about it. You'd think I would know what to do, but I still don't eat enough. But then when I'm coaching a camp, I will be slamming every piece of food in because I know as a coach, I can't afford to get bonked and grumpy. <laughs> um, so that's actually like my best learning experience is when I'm on those. And then it's like, okay, what what else can I possibly eat? Um, so when you're on these trips, do you, do you, you know, worry about protein or fat or carbohydrate or anything, or is it really just a matter of like, how many calories can I get in right now? Uh, I think the latter is probably where I, my mindset is, is like, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to follow the Canada's food guide or something so much. It's, <laughs> it's more, <laughs> it's more like just trying to, trying to, um, make sure that I, um, eat enough and one gauge is like if you for me when I'm that we're that active you know several hours of cycling every single day is just make sure you don't go to bed hungry because that's can be a sign that you haven't eaten enough mm-hmm. um, but like at night like for dinner yeah I definitely make sure there's like components of all like different food groups it's important some people like active travel to eat too much junk food to be honest yeah um so i'm always seeking out a protein source whatever that might be um and like the carbs and then as much as we try as like as much vegetables as we can get because sometimes that's a limiting factor when you travel Mm -hmm. is not being able to get enough of those like kind of nutrient dense vegetables in there so my my girlfriend is really good at trying to learn like a local language of we were when we were for example we were cycle touring in vietnam and she learned how to say like a big pile of sauteed greens and like almost every little pop shop had that even though they didn't have it on the menu or we couldn't read the menu anyway but she learned how to say that and next thing you know we were ordering that every night and you got this big pile of steaming local greens and and you could just feel the nutrition going into your body with those so that is literally the best piece of advice i've ever heard in my life like learn how to ask for a pile of vegetables yeah, yeah. something like find a local person <laughs> like we would be at the thailand food market at night and you would see somebody with something like you really wanted and you just try to like get them to like tell you how to order that thing because you know you might not have no idea how to get that piece of food if you if you don't uh, try to interact and figure out how to do that yeah, no, that's that's super smart. I, I admit I'm terrible for learning local languages. I, I really want to as we're traveling, um, but my, my pronunciation and my um, self-esteem yeah. or self-confidence in being able to <laughs> say anything. Um, my friend Adam and I, is, we were laughing, we're in Paris. Start and, to get a, yeah, yeah, you start we, to get a little tired too, and yeah. then you get frustrated and you're like, oh, forget it, man, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, I give up. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, someone in Paris would say, you know, bonjour to us. And we're just like, uh, hello. We're like, we both know how to speak <laughs> French. What's wrong with us? <laughs> and we also learned in Costa Rica, we were surprised that as soon as you get away, kind of at it. The other thing is when you get away from the t- uh, tourist places, there's even less chance of English. Yeah. So the more you know, or, or at least the more you try, it helps. Like, as everyone should know, by speaking English louder doesn't help. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yelling it is not going to make it more comprehensible. (laughs) (laughs) So I wonder here, maybe to close off, you know, you have this book, Rocket Fuel. Um, It seems like it's got some really great recipes and things that people might be able to use on some of their, I guess, first maybe short bikepacking, but certainly just for for riding and sort of outdoor adventures. Did you want to just touch on what uh, Rocket Fuel is all about and what's sort of inside that that book? Sure, happy to. Um... So the premise of the book is that you don't, well, there's nothing completely wrong with relying on sport nutrition products. Um, You can really fuel yourself on stuff you make in your own kitchen. Uh, It's not, I wasn't reinventing the food wheel here. I mean, if you watch the early stages or early parts of stages in the Tour de France, they're always pulling out these like kind of foil packets 
of thing. I don't know if you guys have seen that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's like cakes or something like that's not just an energy bar, energy gel. Um, because, you know, at 21 stages, if that's all you eat, you are going to have some serious issues <laughs> for both palate wise and gastro wise. So the premise of the book is just to show people how they could how they can make their fuel both for before a workout during a workout and after a workout to both increase the pleasure of working out because there's really nothing better than eating stuff you've made yourself because it just it just tastes better and also about um components of these foods that are definitely going to improve your performance um so i have three main chapters one is um ideas for things that are really good for before a workout to help uh fuel um varieties of types of workouts and then i have more of the the second chapter is more of stuff that's portable that you can carry with you while you're working out um, and then after are things that you can make ahead um, that are really good at helping um, kind of kick start the recovery process after whatever kind of adventure or, or exercise you've taken part in um, yeah, yeah, and they look delicious. I'm looking at the uh, Rocket Fuel Foods Facebook page right now, and there's some some sample photos and so forth. And there's nut butter and jam plus Japanese rice balls, which sound amazing. Um, yeah, yeah, there's awesome. no shortage of kind of ways you can <laughs> think yeah. of tasty ways to make rice uh, and peanut butter go together in many different <laughs> ways, right? Yeah, um, and but, I, I believe, like I heard you guys had a podcast where you. Um, you kind of speed hiked um, that trail in Clarny. Yeah, correct? yeah, yeah. And I you wish, were I wish saying, "Oh, you wish the first, the first day, you wish you weren't, you know, nailing out like, you know, crushing those energy bars or <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> had something a little more savory." Well, and we, even just like the portability of things like that, right? Like if you have those rice balls, or I see also there's like no bake fago bars or something like that, right? And and like you say, it's not rocket science, but it's it's stuff where it travels pretty well and it's fairly easy to make. But then you know you can pull it out and eat it like you would an energy bar, right? But it, it's it's a very different interaction than you know your whatever company's. Uh, energy bar, right? Where you have the foil wrapper and it's pretty, you know, dry like space food. Yeah, and it's you know the kind of same old flavors a lot of times, and because um, I know if I'm on like a full day ride, like 100, 150 kilometers or something, I'm much gonna look more forward to stopping and you know fueling if it's I get to pull out you know a little mini pancakes that I've made or or some sort of like a um, homemade energy ball or something like that. It just it's just something I think my palate's gotten more used to craving um, over the long term as I've gotten more used to making my own fuel. Yeah, sort of just thinking, you know, all these – in Molly's book, she wrote a bit about sort of just like, you know, people love cookies. They love desserts and stuff, and, and maybe during the ride is, you know, a, a time you can sort of fit those in and enjoy them and, and maybe not have quite as much downside. Um, you know, and in case in point here, you have, you know, also some, some muffins or something like that, right? So it's really – it's open to what people, you know, what, what, what are those treats you want? And you can sort of make them yourself and make them maybe even a little healthier than the pre-made stuff. Yeah, correct. I mean, you're not, I mean, you can make things with actual real blueberries instead of blueberry flavoring. Right. And, uh, <laughs> and also savory as well. Cause I find uh, also on a, like when I travel a lot or been cycling a lot. Uh, after a while, you kind of get a little tired of, the sweet taste of everything mm -hmm. it's kind of palate fatigue and one maybe, of the things maybe you guys do i can oh, uh, <laughs> i'll just eat snickers all day i'm good <laughs> yeah molly it's was funny you mentioned that because yeah, several she... years ago i did go ahead yeah I, I, sorry yeah i was like i did a big cycling trip down the west coast of the u.s and um yeah, it's, I remember then I was like, I think I caught myself a couple of times. I think I'm eating too many Snickers. <laughs> no such thing. No such thing. <laughs> we had brought a bunch of Snickers along for the Killarney hike, and I was like, oh, yeah, Peter will totally eat these. I think I ate all of them, to be honest. Peter had, like, rice and canned salmon at night. I had a Snickers. Oh. Have you ever upgraded the Snickers? Like, you, you spread, like, peanut butter on it, and then you... Oh man! Maybe put a little honey on it. It's ridiculous. It's... I do that. I've done that with like Cliff bars, to be honest. But I've not done <laughs> yeah, that I've done... with a Snickers. <laughs> now I know what we're doing next time we do the the Killarney Trail. 
<laughs> to be honest, <laughs> in Killarney though, I was so mosquito bitten the first night that I think my body was in shock and I like couldn't handle the idea of eating a savory meal. Like I didn't even want to eat. I was so like, just messed up from that. So that's my defense of Snickers. <laughs> well, that's a good defense. I think my, uh, my girlfriend said she, she's, she's not going to do the grand depart in July because she's waiting till the bugs are dead. To, uh... <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm with her on that one. <laughs> I didn't believe anyone when they said it was bug season. I was like, oh, yeah, there's going to be a few mosquitoes. Yeah, they bite through everything. Um, and there's a lot of them. <laughs> Never thought I'd be running with a backpack on, like a full on Ooh. hiking pack. <laughs> Well, it gets you around the trail faster. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly. what we, we figured. It was sort of a blessing in disguise because it sort of motivated, and there wasn't a lot of stopping for yeah. photos or anything. No. <laughs> well, and all the photos would have had me wearing a bug net on my head, so they weren't really that good anyway. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, why don't you tell everyone where everyone can find all of your things. I think you're like me where it's like, okay, well, here's the 18 different things that I'm doing and ways you can find me. So let's hear it. Sure. Uh, well, I guess you could just find me at uh, MatthewKady.com. Um, so M-A-T-T-H-E-W-K-A-D-E-Y.com. Um, and the newest project, which is my uh, bike packing route in Ontario, is uh, BT700.ca. And, uh, yeah, from there you can like find all the social media mm -hmm. kind of clutter from there. <laughs> Perfect. And we'll have all of the links yeah. in the show notes. So it'll be super easy for everybody to find. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for, for taking the time to chat. I'm now excited about bike packing again. I feel like I go up and down on it one day. I'm like, I never want to bike pack again. That's dumb. And then the next day I'm like, we should do like a cross country ride. So I waffle. <laughs> But maybe, <laughs> maybe the BT seven hundred is a good like middle ground and it for might us. Have like these portable waffles that you can take with you on it. So perfect. Thanks so much for tuning into the Consummate Athlete Podcast. Uh, you can check out my stuff over at theoutdooredit.com or by following me on Instagram and Twitter at Molly J. Herford. And you can check out Peter's coaching, training plans, blogs, all that fun stuff over at smartathlete.ca or by following him on Twitter and Instagram at Peter Glassford. And if you want to support this show and other awesome podcasts, please check out wideanglepodium.com for show info, other podcasts, bonus content and to become a donating member so you can get all of that rad behind the scenes content and help keep shows like this on the air. And lastly, if you're enjoying this podcast and all the information that we're bringing to you every single week, uh, do us a solid and pop into iTunes to leave us a rating and review. It takes you about two seconds. You can do it on your computer. You can do it on your phone and it really helps us out. Thanks so much. And we will see you next week.